Hello friends, welcome to our show, Adhyatmik Safar, Adhyatmik Journey, Journey of the Soul. And uh, today I have a question for you. What do, what do you think when uh, somebody utters the word renunciation? What comes to your mind? So I have several options. A, is it somebody who has renounced all the pleasures of this world? B, um, somebody who has a very dull and boring existence? And C, somebody who's not ambitious enough? Or D, all of the above? I bet your answer is going to be all of the above. And you know what? My answer would be the same and a little bit more. What I thought that renunci renunciation is uh, something that happens when um, a person is a perfect loser. You know, he doesn't have money, he doesn't have a house, he doesn't have, you know, his wife has left him. And then he has no other option but to become a renunciation. And I used to think that in that case, it's... Um, he didn't renounce anything, actually, everything else renounced him. But what happened that just some time back, I met this amazing, wonderful, enlightened Swami, who changed my very definition, my very concept of the word renunciation. And his name happened to be Tyagananda. Tyag, as you know, in Sanskrit means renunciation, a renunciant. Surprisingly, Swami Tyagananda comes from a very well-to-do family of very successful professionals. And uh, he went to top-notch schools. He had a top-notch degree. He had the entire world waiting for him to prove to others his success, his brilliant mind, his wonderful personality. But he chose a different path. He wanted Success, yes. He wanted happiness, yes. But beyond the material existence, he was looking for something else. Welcome, Swamiji. It's a great honor and pleasure to have you here. And I'm really very, very happy to get this opportunity to interview you. How are you doing today? Pranams, Namaste. Thank you for having me in your program. It's very nice to be with you all today. Thank you, Swamiji. So, Swamiji, you must have heard my introduction on renunciation, and uh, um, it's coming from a very, very lay, materialistic mind. So, please forgive me if um, I gave a very crass definition of what renunciation or a renunciant means for me. But after meeting you, I changed my mind. And I want our audience also to understand what is the meaning, true meaning of renunciation. And your name, as it suggests, bliss through inner, inner renunciation. And I know you chose that name for yourself. So let's, let's ask you some questions. Uh, please help us understand that as a Westerner, as a Westerner born and raised in Europe, and then you know you spend several years of your youth and adult life in monastic ashram in the United States. So what has drawn you to the teachings of Sanatan Dharma from ancient India? And in particular, what is it that you find so inspiring in the teachings of yoga meditation? Yes, certainly. I understand how 
the word renunciation may trigger certain thoughts and uh, perceptions in the most part of people. So even in Indians like you, Anjali. Well, but uh, as you said, my full name is Tiagananda. And as you know, I would begin with the last sentence, the last part of the name, Ananda, as you know, meaning divine joy, the state of happiness or complete inner fulfillment that we all want. And if you ask me what drove me to leave my family in Northern Italy, in Europe, where I grew up, to join a monastic order, to become a Swami, is just that. The desire to attain in this life a lasting joy, a state of complete, all-round success on a physical, mental, and above all, spiritual sense. And that's what the ancient rishis, the great masters of ancient India, who taught the Sanatan Dharma, explained that what we really want as men and women in this human experience is the state of joy that is always with us, Anand. And the yogis, again, of ancient India thought that to the most direct route to attain the joy is the capacity, developing the capacity to set aside, to relinquish, to leave it behind, even if temporarily our emotional involvement, our attachments toward the material life. And that's what tiaga is, as you said, in Sanskrit it means inner renunciation. So our guru founder, Prahmans Yogananda, would explain, describe tiaga as an investment, right? Like all of you, all of us set aside money regularly and we deprive ourselves of certain satisfactions or pleasures right now. Why? Because we have a goal in mind. And that's when renunciation is a form of self-discipline and investment becomes more attractive, doesn't it? Because it's in the service of attaining a higher goal. Does it make sense? Um, absolutely, Swamiji, it, uh, it does make sense. Uh, uh, the way you have explained renunciation, so <laughs> from what I am understanding that we are the actual renunciants because, you know, we are the ones who are renouncing small, uh, small I mean, big pleasures in place of small, uh, small happiness. So, uh, and... and, yeah, in and a way, yeah, in a way, it's true, if, if I may comment, Anjali, in a way, as you said, I grew up in a family where I, I had everything. I was very blessed also materially. And I could see my grandfather being a medical doctor and two brothers of my father having medical clinics, leading a very successful life in a material way. But the question would be, were they truly, truly happy? Right. In, in a way, yes, to a certain extent, material abundance, prosperity, successful career, human love, relationships do give us a certain amount of joy. But it can be limited. It can be very fragile, right? One moment is there, next, next moment is gone. And that's what, as a teenager, I felt, well, but it may not last. I want something that is with me forever. And that's the joy, Anand, that comes when we as souls, our Atman becomes awakened again and merges with Brahman, the infinite spirit. And that process, as you well know, is called yoga. It's not just physical exercises. And this is what, in answer to your question, what, what drew me here, what attracted me, that was very, very attractive to me as a youth. And I know also working certainly many young adults who are interested in the ancient teachings of Sanatan Dharma, the teachings from the golden ages of India, to help men and women to attain a balanced state of harmonious body, mind and soul, to attain that lasting joy and happiness. I know that for younger people and all of us, knowing that there is a practical method, the science, which is also an art that allows us to calm the body, quiet the mind, focus our consciousness within so that we gradually realize who we truly are, the soul, not just the frail, weak body who may get sick and die, the mind that can be so restless and so unhappy. We are the soul, which is a reflection of the divine spirit. And as you well know, being from an Indian tradition, the, the removal 
of all possible sources of suffering in the body, mind, emotions, and on the positive side, the attainment of the state of joy and happiness that is always with us, that is what truly is Sanatan Dharma. That's why the teachings from ancient India are so current, so relevant to all of us, because they go beyond traditional religions, right? They go Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely, Swamiji. And actually, you know, from the way you are explaining to me about finding the real uh, joy within and God as being the source, this reminds me of um, a chapter from Autobiography of a Yogi. And uh, here at this juncture, I would like to say a couple of uh, sentences about Autobiography of a Yogi, which we all know is a spiritual classic and uh, self-realization fellowship. This is the organization that uh, Swamiji is from. And Swamiji is a disciple of uh, a very, very highly advanced, uh, a very well-known uh, yogi, Paramhansa Yogananda. So he wrote a spiritual classic autobiography of a yogi. And uh, this year happens to be the 75th anniversary of autobiography of a yogi. Yes. Uh, Swamiji, I have read that book. And let me tell you, I keep a copy oh, of that yeah. book all the time. So when you mentioned um, that uh, we have to depend on our inner strength, we have to depend on God, our inner soul, for fulfillment of all happiness for abundance. It did remind me of that story to penniless boys in Vrindavan, yeah. where um, Yogananda, whose name was Mukunda at that time, his older brother who believed in, um, you know, achieving materialistic success and, and nothing else did tell him that you, uh, you don't, if you depend on God to actually supply you for food, shelter, etc., etc., you're going to be just left with a begging bowl. And Yogananda said that um, for, for God's devotees, you know, God has many other options, just not a begging bowl. <laughs> and I thought, I, I, I really find that story, it's, it's not only like very inspiring, the way Yogananda has written about it, it's, it is, it's hilarious and it's, uh, it's, it, it's just instills that faith in you that how if you are depending on the real source, and doing all the efforts, you know, at your end to achieve, uh, success will always come to you no matter what. Yes, so um, yes. I, I think that is what, you know, uh, your, uh, whatever you explained about depending on God and not just depending on your uh, outward sources to give success, you know, it, 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 it ties in. So, yes, it's very true. If I may add, uh, uh, Anjali, it's a question, Yogananda made it very clear. It's not that we, especially for those who are householders who have husband, wife and children careers, it's not that we ignore the material aspect of life. Yoga in the Sanatana Dharma teaches us to place God first, meaning placing the attainment of the realization of the self, capital S, the infinite spirit, before everything else. And in the story that you uh, quoted from the autobiography Yogi, that was the interesting dialogue between Yogananda as a young boy who said, God first, money, family later, and his brother who said, money first, career first, material life first, then if there is time, we'll attend to God. But then, as you know, what happened? They, his older brother actually passed away because of Asiatic cholera so young. And that's the fragility of our human condition that I was referring to. Because I too, I was 16 when I read their biography the first time in my life. And that changed completely my outlook into what we can do with this life, right? And that's why I decided to follow the path of yoga. First in the world, studying, going to college, university, and then actually joining an ashram. Yes, absolutely, Swamiji. Um, so being a Westerner and, uh, you know, having all the um, uh, material pleasures available at your, you know, doorstep, 
what would you say, um, you know, was, I mean, Yogananda's message, of course, you know, attracted you and it had such a strong impact. And uh, we all know that, uh, you know, that was one of the missions that Yogananda had when he came to the West. But we'd like to know from you that what would you say it's one of the most important messages of uh, yeah. Paramahansa Yogananda to yes, the West. To the West. Kriya, yeah. Kriya Yoga, meaning the science, meaning a very practical method, not just words. I grew up in a in the West, Western Europe, uh, going to some of the best schools and uh, universities where there were brilliant men and women teaching science, philosophy, psychology, religion. But it was a very, almost exclusively theoretical approach, very intellectual, and ultimately it wouldn't really fulfill us. It was very vague, very indefinite. But then, I read the biography yogi, I apply for the lessons of self-realization fellowship, as you said, the spiritual society founded by Swami Yogananda in 1920 here in the United States. And what I receive is very specific practical methods, as you know, called in the ancient science of yoga, pranayama, to regulate the life force, to concentrate the mind, to awaken the divine essence within us through regulated breathing, concentration, meditation uh, exercises, and even the aspect of bhakti yoga, devotional chanting. So there is a very tangible way now to grow spiritually, to follow the spiritual life. And... Uh, the results are there if you apply ourselves, as we discipline ourselves a little bit daily with meditation, then right away we feel a sense of peace, a sense of expanding joy in our hearts. The mind becomes quieter, there is the inner guidance. That becomes very attractive, even more attractive than what pleasures of the world can offer. And so it's not a question of just uh, grim renunciation, forcing ourselves to cast aside, to set aside, to stay away from things of the world. It's just that we consciously say, wait a minute, I have something better here. I have something greater that gives me greater joy, happiness, and even long-lasting health. So that's what I want, right? <laughs> So it takes a little bit of discipline, though, in the beginning. <laughs> yes, Swamiji, um, you know, this is a very important message that you are giving to the audience, because if there is anything that people are looking for in this day and age, I think in any day and age, it's happiness, joy, <laughs> success. And what you are saying that you can get all of these by following a certain, you know, a, a disciplined path, something like yoga, and you don't have to renounce everything. Because of course, if everybody were to become a renunciant and you know, uh, move to the forest, the forest would have to be converted to cities. Exactly. <laughs> but yes. what you are saying that we don't need to do that. This is something which is within us. And if we follow a certain disciplined path of yoga, we can achieve that. So can you please explain to our audience, how would you describe uh, the spiritual society that Yogananda founded, Self-Realization Fellowship, or the sister organization, Yogada Satsang Society, for the benefit of our audience living in India? Because you describe that you um, subscribe to some lessons, some exactly. um, online lessons, um, I, I'm not, not sure in your, your time, of course, you wouldn't be having online lessons, but right. uh, what is it that uh, you have been following? What is this discipline path? And uh, especially in the context of busy Indians, like yes. us living in the United States. Right. So what do you think SRF has to offer? Yes, I'd like to clarify first that Self-Religion Fellowship is not only in monastic order. Yes, uh, we have... Uh, many of us, men and women, who decided to dedicate, to consecrate our lives completely to the search for God, the attainment of self-realization and sharing whatever we acquire 
with others, serving uh, humankind in the largest sense. But self-realization fellowship in the West and Yogoda Satsanga Society, the sister society, as it is known in India, is very much a spiritual society that is there to assist men and women in the world, like you, Anjali, who are married, you have a work, career, parents, relatives, children. And the master didn't come to the West trying to convert everybody to Hinduism or to make them sannyasis, monks and nuns. Not so. He would say the goal is where you are, in whatever station, condition of life you are, married, single, family, working, we learn these ancient methods of yoga. In the science, complete balance science that Yogananda gave to us and to the householders as well is called Kriya Yoga. Like some of the gurus in our lineage were householders, like Lady Masha, or even in a way Lord Krishna was married. He wasn't a monastic. So it's not a question just being monastic or single or married. The question is being a yogi. And as Lord Krishna says in the Gita, it's not just talking about it, but it's practicing the methods of Raja Yoga that helps us to be in tune with the infinite. So in answer to your question, what has self fellowship to offer? In a practical way, again, uh, these system, this system of teachings that these days, in my own way, when I started in the early 80s, so nearly 40 years ago, it was lessons, printed out matter, being sent to the, from the mother center to anyone in the world. Now, of course, with the advance of technology, we have digital lessons. So one may enroll and receive the lessons as an app. And there are many auxiliary material, guided meditations. That's what I would like to emphasize. Our guru founder would say, yes, spiritual study is important. Self-reflection is important. But more important than that, reserving a little bit of time every day, even just 20 minutes, if possible, half an hour, once a day, if, if one has more time, twice a day, to practice meditation. So that's the cornerstone. That's the foundation. And I'd like to emphasize again, it's not just for monks uh, living in ashrams. Uh, complete renunciates, but even for yogis, householders like you, who in a way learn the true meaning of inner renunciation, tiaga, meaning you have husband uh, or wife or children and work, you in, get involved in activities of the world, householder activities or the work, a career, but inwardly we learn, we discipline ourselves not to become emotionally disturbed, not so emotionally identified with the activities. In a way, we monks too, in the ashram learn that, right? <laughs> because even we in the ashram have, uh, we have to manage our centers, our ashrams, uh, we have to take care of other people, of our seniors. So it's an inner attitude that we cultivate. And what really helps us is the study and practice of the yoga meditation teachings taught by Paramahansa Yogananda. So Swamiji, you said about, you, you, you just mentioned a very important point that not to be emotionally identified. Now the times in which we are living, I think this is again a very important concept and I'm going to come to it. I do have a question in my mind, especially related to pandemic, but before we get there, I want to know a couple of more things about your organization. You mentioned um, uh, you mentioned meditation, uh, taking our 20 minutes every day, which is, I think, the prescribed uh, method for uh, the devotees or the students of uh, the uh, self-realization fellowship lessons. You also mentioned about bhakti or devotion. So, do you also uh, do? Kirtan, chanting, um, does uh, SRF uh, uh, encourage uh, the devotees or the, the, the swamis to do chanting Kirtan? Oh, very, very much so. <laughs> Not just the swamis, but all of our, all of the devotees, disciples, Parans, Yogananda. Yogananda being himself Prem Avatar, which as you may know means a great master, divine incarnation, whose predominant quality was Prem, divine love. He expressed very much uh, in his own life, in his own teachings, the importance of 
creating a personal loving relationship with the divine in whatever aspect shape form one holds dear in his her heart and as a consequence of creating the relationship with the divine we also express our deepest feelings and desire for intimacy with the divine through what is called of course bhakti yoga the yoga of the heart of devotion so very much in in our meditation services in our gatherings yes we have silent meditation the kriya yoga part and we have the devotional part that is personal but collectively also expressed in the form of chanting so we sing songs of the divine some are what they're called cosmic chants actually composed by our guru some he drew them from the ancient Indian tradition. He was a Bengali, so many uh, devotional Bengali songs or uh, devotional songs that were written by great poets and saints of India, like poets like Rabindranath Tagore and others. So the formula that Yogananda has given us in his own words is Kriya Yoga plus devotion it works like mathematics it cannot fail meaning to help us attain self-realization which means that say if we have an hour of meditation service we read a little bit inspirational uh, readings of Paramahansa Yogananda and then we meditate silently and that's more of the Kriya Yoga part with pranayama methods to interiorize our consciousness and then we chant. We chant collectively kirtans and bhajans. And by the way, Anjali, I understand that you are also an accomplished musician, singer, uh, singing bhajans to Lord Krishna and other traditional uh, kirtans. Would, would you like to offer one of your uh, bhajans or kirtan for your oh, audience? Sure, yeah. sure. Thank you so much, uh, Swamiji. That was, um, I remember when um, I, I actually met you it was, uh, you know, one of the singing programs, and um, I, I'm very happy and honored that you remember that. Uh, talking of bhakti, yes, um, uh, you know, devotional chanting is something very close to my heart, and I, I love to do that. And uh, yes, of course, I will be very happy to do, and you know, maybe we can take a break at this point. Um, as you know, Janamashtami is very close. Yes. And uh, when we talk of love, when we talk of Prem, uh, the one avatar that comes to our mind is Lord Krishna. Yes. Because everybody loved him. Everybody loved him. And uh, uh, he was, uh, and one aspect of Krishna, which is, uh, which is always, I have always felt very attracted to, is the mischievous, the baby Krishna, uh, who, you know, Mother Yashoda loved. And uh, the gopis, they, they loved him. And so this is one, one bhajan that I have in my mind. Um, this is about baby Krishna when he was taking his first steps. Mm. But um, I would, uh, surely I would uh, sing a few lines, but uh, I would like to start with, um, you know, talking of, we were talking of 75th anniversary of Yogananda's book. And he is, um, uh, he is a very renowned guru. Um, so I'll start with this Sanskrit um, chant. Brahmanandam Paramasukadam. And uh, you may be aware of this chant, uh, Swamiji. Uh, <laughs> Brahmanandam Paramasukadam Kevalam Gyanamurtim, which means full of bliss, full of joy. Yes. And I bow to your feet, O Divine Guru. Yeah, we chant it often too, yes. <laughs> sure. Brahma. Paramasukadam Kevalam Gyana Murtim Dvandvatitam Gagana Sadrisham Tatvamasya Chalam Sarvadi Sakshi Bhutam Bhavad 
अतीतम त्रिगुणारहितम सकुरु So this is the bhajan uh, for Lord Krishna that uh, I will be singing, and uh, this was uh, originally sung by our uh, Nightingale, Indian Nightingale, Lata Ji. The words are Nand Bhavan Nand Lala Thuma Ka Chala Na Lage, meaning Lord Krishna he is taking his first baby steps, and uh, in the uh, courtyard of uh, Nand and Yashoda. and uh, the gods and goddesses from the top they are they are watching mother earth is feeling very blessed that little krishna's feet uh, is touching her and then further on um this in this bhajan <laughs> surda ji says that um krishna with his friends he he we all know that he was very fond of butter and milk and yogurt so he says that the owner of this entire universe everything belongs to him is actually he he plans and he is so mischievous that uh, just for a little butter for a little yogurt he is trying to fool his mom he is trying to fool the other gopis and again of course he was just doing it uh, to give pleasure to his devotees who were in the form of the gopis and in the form of maya shoda so here goes the bhajan nand bhavan nand lal thumak chalan lage nand bhavan nand lal thumak chalan lage piche ma yasho
अष्टमित्र अष्ट सखा सर पर है मोर पखा अष्टमित्र अष्ट सखा सर पर है मोर पखा दधि के हित और कौन दधि के हित और कौन शीर सिंधु त्यागे दधि के हित और कौन शीर सिंधु त्यागे लाल चरण लागे ठुमक ठुमक चरण लागे नंद भवन नंद लाल ठुमक चरण लागे पीछे Thank you very beautiful. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you very so much Swami. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Oh no, certainly. <laughs> so Swami ji let's um, move ahead with our interview. I have so many questions and I I don't know if I if we have enough time, you know, we can we can not have enough of you. I mean you have answered everything so beautifully and uh, in the language of, you know, that that lay people like me will understand. So coming back to uh, your organization self realization fellowship i understand that there is a worldwide online convocation going on and you know i i understand because of the pandemic it's online but i have had the fortune to attend uh, one of the convocations you know for a couple of days and i met some of the devotees out there so Uh, how have things changed in the pandemic and uh, you know what are some of the basic themes and you know some of the guiding principles that you and the srf uh, monast monastics they will be addressing during this uh, 2021 online convocation yes it's very true in th this very week uh, our society self position fellowship is holding this world convocation online and uh, the main theme as given by our president shri brother chidananda ji is discovering the inner potential of our souls particularly as you mentioned earlier anjali at this point in time when now it has been several months or over a year that all men and women in the world have been in a way negatively affected by the pandemic and economic recession and uh, this sense of insecurity and instability so as you may know our guru founder pramas yogananda ji started the tradition of these convocations once a year in august initially there were only a few hundred people then thousands and now we have reached several several thousands that they connect online we have of course large membership in the united states very large of course in india where they follow also the programs of the our sister society the goda satsang society and then all over the world europe south america australasia in answer to your question monastics so monks as well as nuns uh, are guiding meditations that's where we place the emphasis uh, helping everybody whoever they are young not so young married single busy not so busy to learn the simple practical methods of communion with the infinite in the ancient science of kriya yoga we have kirtans as you also beautifully sang we we have devotional chanting we have satsangas where uh, our members sent in questions how to apply the teachings of 
Sanatan Dharma spirituality in their business, in their daily life, rearing children, in relationships, in uh, in dealing uh, with the turbulence of this world. And we have various classes every day uh, that in a way have the goal. Swamiji, one question for you. You know, you talked about classes and that reminded me, I did attend one of your classes during a previous um, uh, convocation. So I just didn't want to want our audience to miss out on that. Is there any class that you are um, uh, yes, having? Yes, tomorrow, Wednesday afternoon, uh, there will be a presentation. It's mostly for a younger uh, member, students, is a, what we would call the youth class. But it's, it's how to be a seeker in this world, how to deal with the pandemic, with the restrictions imposed by what we are going through at this time. And so I invite, encourage especially younger generations, younger people to watch the presentation. And at the end, there will be uh, a mini guided meditation where they can get a sample. And one does not need to become a student or an official member of SRF. They can log in going online on YouTube and they can participate into the most of these guided meditations and, and uh, presentations and lecture and talks. And maybe toward the end, you can show also the link that we sent you. Otherwise, the website to go to is www.yogananda-srf.org and then you go to Convocation Online and then we have a YouTube channel. And then, uh, Anjali, I would of course uh, invite everyone to, if possible, this Thursday morning, our president, Sri Chidanandaji, is actually himself guiding a meditation and it can be so profound, so beautiful when a man of uh, the stature uh, spiritually and can guide us uh, in the methods, in the practices, in the visualizations and affirmations and chanting. And then at the end of this week, we'll be having the closing program, which is on Saturday morning when uh, Brother Chidananda, again, as president and leader of our society, will give this final keynote talk primarily addressing the need of many women in the world to to feel more that everything's going to be all right where, uh, where do we get the direction we need in our life to make decisions at this time so i believe the theme will be finding the inner compass right like the ancient mariners when they're sailing in the tumultuous seas of life they need the pole star they need the uh, to use the tools as navigators to navigate these treacherous waters of life. So we acknowledge, we have to accept the fact that these can be our hard times for most people in the world. At the same time, yes, there's been a crisis. There is a crisis going on, but the teachings of Yogananda and the great masters of all the great spiritual traditions teach us well, instead of becoming so identified with your negative emotions of fear, anxiety, and becoming alarmed and disturbed, or even angry and resentful, why don't we shift to a higher consciousness, the soul, through yoga, through meditation, through sangha, through by talking about these things as we, you and I are doing today, and we shift to this higher level where we take this crisis as an opportunity, Opportunity for what? To discipline ourselves in body, mind, and soul, to learn new methods that can help us to be healthier in body, mind, to calm our thoughts and emotions, and to connect with the infinite. So it becomes a precious opportunity, right, that uh, we can use at this time. Um, yes, absolutely, Swamiji. Actually, you know, this was going to be my next question for you. You started answering it yourself. But before, um, before I ask you a question connected to the pandemic, I want to just say one thing to our audience about um, Swamiji's classes. Um, friends, I have attended his youth classes, and I'm telling you, this is something not to miss. This is really something not to miss. He just gave out the link for the SRF World Convocation, which is on at the moment. His classes on 
um, is it Wednesday or Thursday, Swamiji? Wednesday afternoon, the class will be given on uh, for the youth, but anybody is okay. welcome. We're all young at heart. <laughs> yes. So Wednesday afternoon is his class. So please don't miss. And if you, if your kids can also attend those classes, that that will be awesome. It's 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 really going to be helpful. All right. Now back to the question on pandemic. Yes, this is the hot topic. Everybody is impacted with it. <laughs> There's not a single person who is not. And uh, of course, you know, we are humans, so there is feeling of insecurity, there is anxiety. And uh, yes, you mentioned that uh, in order for us to um, stay away from these negative emotions, we have to go inside, you know, to our inner core. But more and more people in the United States, in the world, Certainly in India, you, you are aware of, uh, you know, the second yes. wave which has taken so many lives. People, even those who are alive at the moment, my own friends, everybody is having such tremendous feelings of anxiety, insecurity. Uh, you know, is my job going to stay? How am I going to feed my family? So, um, Swamiji, are there any practical ways, any practical methods that you can share with our audience so that they can face these challenges due to the pandemic or the other challenges, you know, with the turbulent world that it's, it's, they are all always on. So could you yes, share? Yes, certainly. Well, first thing, uh, uh, from a higher perspective, we also have to understand what the great masters of all ancient traditions, certainly from India, have said you, of course, many of you, especially from the Indian tradition, are familiar with Ramakrishna Paramahansa, a great avatar of Ramana Maharishi who lived in the past century. And in different ways, they both said that until and unless men and women on this planet Earth become more spiritual, then there will be th various things in creation, in this physical creation in the world like wars, pestilences, and other misfortunes that will propel us toward the higher consciousness. So as Guruji says in his own book, Autobiography, suffering is a prod to remembrance. Remembering what? Remember that in a way, God did not create this physical world just as a place where we can find continuous lasting happiness and material comforts. Yes, we can experience and we do up to a certain extent. But it, it, it would seem as the great masters and saints say that it's it's in God's plan that planet Earth is not exactly for us to be always happy. It's a place, it's a school where we learn lessons. And periodically, unless we behave as good students, unless we are learning a lessons, then as the master is to say then divine mother the great mother of the universe god will shake the world in such a way also it is because of our own karma individual and collective now some people may not like this may not be ready to hear that I understand that and you don't have to accept this notion but what we can say practically what the master what yogananda would tell us is even quoting the christian scriptures instead of becoming anxious instead of worrying about everything why don't you pray about everything so uh, you may turn on the tv or media news and of course uh, all of us are saddened in a way we can't help but being a little emotionally disturbed when you see so much suffering so many people young and old getting sick and dying or people losing their jobs so but instead of stopping there, then, okay, instead of praying, becoming anxious, fearful, or unhappy, let's pray. Let's pray to the divine. Please help these poor people in India, those who have very little money, those who don't have even the resources to uh, go through this pandemic. Let's pray that the political, social leaders will be enlightened, strengthened to follow the higher ways, the ways of Sanatana Dharma. Let's pray that we ourselves become stronger emotionally and spiritually, that yes, we feel for others, we always love for others, we pray for them, but we do not become so inwardly disturbed 
and dejected and depressed that then we cannot even help our loved ones or in the family, right? So it's an act of balance. Does it make sense? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Swamiji, uh, initially when, uh, when I asked you the first question, you did mention about not being emotionally identified. And yes. you know, that was something which uh, you know, actually stuck with me because I think that is, <laughs> that, that is the whole problem. You know, we are too much emotionally identified and you know, it's, it's very difficult as a human being not to be impacted, but it's of course true. there are Sanatan Dharma or the path of yoga offers, uh, offers a way that we can um, help ourselves out of this misery which is always exactly. going to be there in the outside world. In, in a way, yes, you're very right, Anjali. I mean, I myself, uh, growing up in a Latin culture in Italy, Northern Italy, where emotions uh, are very strong and very, uh, are a very definite trait of our culture, I had to deal with learning how to acknowledge my strong emotions and passions and desires and then to, to purify them, to transmute them. You being a singer and a poet, you may know from the ancient Indian literature, I believe it was Kabir who gave this beautiful illustration when he said the heart of each one of us as a man or a woman is like the confluence of these two mighty rivers. So there is a river, I believe it was the, the, the river that flows to Brindaman, that was the Jamuna, that typically, because it flows in the low valleys, the water can get dark and muddy. And there's Ganga, fresh, pure, clean water. So Kabir would tell his disciples, your heart must become like this pure confluence of these two currents, the current of strong human emotion represented by the Jamuna River. Usually things get dark, right? And then we don't see it clearly anymore. But we connect also to the pure river of Ganga, Mother Ganga, which is the essence of purity, the crystal-like water that flows and purifies our water. And that's the higher feeling, prem, divine love. So when we meditate, that's what happens. We allow the waters of our human passions, emotions to flow through, we cannot suppress them, right? You cannot suppress a river. As a mother, obviously you feel for your daughter, you feel for your husband as a wife. It's very normal, the God, it's God's ordained plan. But you learn, we learn to merge the current of human feelings, the Jamuna River flows into Ganga and Ganga is much more powerful. The waters of purity, of connection with the divine, Shraddha, pure divine love are there. So when, like Yogananda used to say, you have a bowl with dark, muddy water, that's how human consciousness uh, darkened with emotions, but we allow the fresh waters of the ocean again and again and again, or Ganga River, and eventually it's a matter of time it gets purified right so the negative emotions flow away we don't suppress them we offer them to the divine the mighty current of higher love devoid of attachment negative emotions they becomes preponderant predominant in our life and then we feel the chanti divine peace we feel the joy and that and we can share the peace, the joy with others. Yes, the world will always be a little bit like trouble and turmoil because it has always been like that. You know, like some saints say, hey, you have to ask God why he created creation in this way. But that doesn't mean we have to suffer all the time. Like the Buddha used to say to his devotees, yes, yeah, sometimes pain is inevitable because of a war or you hurt yourself, it's a physical pain. But the Buddha would also add, but suffering, meaning the emotional suffering, is optional. It's up to us, right? Does it make sense? Yes, yes, Swamiji. So, Swamiji, um, I have a request. Um, there is this last question that uh, I have for you. But after you answer this question, if you have, like, you know, a couple of minutes, can I please request you to guide our audience, you know, through a, a very short period of meditation? Because you talked so much about, um, you know, the inner peace and uh, the inner joy. 
I think it would be very nice if our audience can have just maybe a small taste, a slight taste of that peace and joy, yeah. even if it is for just for a couple of minutes, and if you could guide us through that. So here is my last question, that what is the basic message that you would like to share with uh, the men and women in this world, with family? I mean, we, all of us, you know, who have family, who have, uh, you know, work, our social duties, we are trying to keep our lives in balance, and, you know, we want to cultivate a spiritual life. And I know that you have answered this in many different ways, but maybe if, uh, you know, Maybe a, a short answer, yes, or, yes, certainly. or just the essence of essence of it, and and to the young people, what kind of positive encouragement and guidance would you like to offer? Yes, certainly, I follow you, Anjali. Well, in one sentence, you know, it's like an aphorism from the ancient Eastern tradition. They would say, "To find your way home, follow." those who have come back. Now, what does it mean? The way home, home is that place of joy, peace, happiness, success, all around success in the material world, whether you are young, single, old, or married, whatever. To find our way to that happiness and fulfillment and contentment, follow the way of the masters, those who have come back, meaning those who have been there, those who have attained nirvana or the highest state of self-realization, God, union, and they've been there, they've done that, and they had come back to us. The great masters, Lord Krishna, Christ, Buddha, the Paramahansa Yogananda, they come back to us and they give us instruction. So my... If you ask me what I would say, young people or all of you, all of us, follow the masters. These days it's so easy to become confused the moment you go online and you, you don't know who to believe any longer, right? We want to follow those who have attained what we want to attain, right? Those who can tell us. So that's why I would say practically every day, reading some of the books of the enlightened masters. I like this book, if I may show it to your audience, Anjali, where there is light, insights and inspiration for meeting life's challenges. And there's various chapters on different needs, as you said, for health, to overcome anxiety, to attain inner peace, for success in the world, relationships, understanding death. And of course, the end, the consummate goal. Why are we here on earth? What is the purpose of this life? What are we supposed to do? So learning, learning how to live well. And it is now that we want to live. And we want to live well. It's not that we have to wait until we die, we go to the other side. And by the way, Angel, you were mentioning about learning how to meditate for newcomers. Those who may be interested, but they may not feel comfortable yet to sign up for the lessons. In this book, there is a chapter entirely dedicated to learning how to meditate, the basic universal principles. And so if you want, whenever you are ready, I can read just a few lines from this book. There are also affirmations, mini guided meditations, and then we can have a two minute, uh, very brief meditation to end our time together. Absolutely, Swamiji. And before you read this, can you also please tell our audience where we can get um we can buy this book, uh, Where There Is Light. Well, of course, uh, these days, any online bookseller like Amazon would carry all of our books easily. Also, we have our own SRF bookstore. And so in, when you go online and you say self listening Fellowship or SRF Bookstore, you can find all the books. There are many others, even uh books for those who want to read more like men's eternal quest the collection of talks by our master for those who are more into the gita of course we have the commentaries of our guru to the bhagavad gita god talks with arjuna the royal sense of god realization especially those are from the indian tradition who are very familiar or they resonate with the teachings of bhagavan krishna and then Many of these small pocket books like uh, Inner Peace or Enter the Quiet Heart, where we always have some practical instruction for meditation. So it's enough to go online. This, this is, as you said, Anjali, Yogananda has become such a household 
master that uh, just by going online, you can add our SRF society, you will find so many books and then different individuals may resonate with different books or going to our website where we also have, apart from the convo online convocation, we already have many guided meditation and kirtans, totally free. One doesn't need to be even a student to remember, and you can just click and watch or download the guided meditations. And I understand also our sister society in India, Yagoda Satsanga Society in India, also makes these guided meditations available in other Indian languages besides Hindi, Tamil, or whatever, Bengali, yes. Thank you so much, Swamiji. And one book that, uh, one more time, that I, I really want to vouch for is this, which is Autobiography of a Yogi. And uh, uh, Self-Realization Fellowship is celebrating the 75th anniversary. And this is a must-read book <laughs> in all aspects. So for all those spiritual seekers or non-spiritual seekers, please do read this book. So, Swamiji, Thank you. I will now <laughs> uh, give the floor to you. Please go ahead and if you can guide us through a short meditation. Yes, I'd like to guide you into, into this brief meditation utilizing the words of Paramahansaji, Paramahansa Yogananda from this book where there's light when he said, darkness cannot exist where there is light. So the darkness of this turbulent world, the bad things of this world and the negative emotions can be, can be dispelled when we open ourselves to the divine light, which has actually is within. And so one way to do it is to simply close our eyes and take a deep breath in and we exhale long and deeply. And as we exhale in breathing out, we are casting aside all restlessness, all negative emotions, anything that is disturbing our hearts and minds. Once again, slowly, deeply breathe in as we inhale, we visualize light, divine light, pure energy, divine peace flowing to us. At the top of the inhalation, we pause briefly, holding the breath inside. And then we exhale. One more time, slowly, deeply inhaling. Hold the breath momentarily. Feel the peace, feel the calmness. And now we exhale. One final time, slow, deep, steady inhalation. Hold the breath inside, feeling the peace, the calmness. And slowly, quietly, we exhale. Now we close eyes, we lift our gaze upward, inwardly, at the point between the eyebrows, in the middle of the forehead, the Kutasta Chaitanya. Without straining, being completely relaxed, we concentrate our inner gaze there. And then at that point, we begin to visualize, to imagine a shining white, blue, gold light. 
the light of spirit, the light of Brahman, the infinite divine energy and consciousness within us, around us. We immerse ourselves in that light, soothing divine light. And as we visualize that light, the spiritual eye, the third eye, now we also add this element of mental chanting the pranava mantra OM. We mentally chant OM. Then OM Shanti. Shanti meaning divine peace. So just for a few moments, Silently, mentally, we chant Om Shanti at the spiritual eye, and we feel and visualize waves of peace, waves of divine light soothing our minds and hearts and spreading to all. Now we end the meditation, folding our hands in Anjali Mudra, the prayer position, with the palms of the heart. We inhale, and as we exhale, we vocalize the mantra Om aloud. Om. As we chant Om, we send vibrations of peace, harmony, healing energy to the whole world. One final time. Breathe in. Shanti. Thank you, Anjali. It was an honor and pleasure to be part of Bharat TV part of your interview. Thank you so much, uh, Swamiji. We are really honored and blessed that we got this opportunity. And I can say to all our audience that today I am also a renunciant because I have renounced all the unhappiness, sorrows, feelings of insecurity, anxiety. So let us all become renunciants because we all want to be happy we all want to be joyful, and the Swamiji has given us some guideposts. Our Sanatan Dharma has given us some guideposts. So let's follow that. And one more time, Swamiji, thank you so much and uh, for honoring us, for blessing us, and for guiding us. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. God bless you all. Thank you. Pranams. Pranams. Pranams.